Thank you, firstly, to the board and the Welsh Government for the time in pulling together the strategy and indeed this webinar today. It's certainly been a challenging time in doing that. So uh, we'll hopefully lay before you today something that you'll be very keen to engage with um, and be involved with. Unfortunately, the minister won't be with us today. She was going to join us, but she's been called away to cabinet. So she sends her sincere apologies. It's certainly not a lack of interest on her behalf. And, and we're very lucky to have Dave Morris from the Welsh Government here today to um, give the viewpoint to the Welsh Government. So just by way of brief introduction, as a post-war generation, the last five months is something that we've not really seen before. Yeah, we all know it's been disruptive, we all know it's been stressful, and we know it's been incredibly unsettling for all involved. And we know we're not out of it yet. We recognise that whilst some food and drink businesses have thrived in the crisis, the vast majority have suffered terribly badly. And we should recognise that many of us have actually lost um, loved ones and friends to this absolutely callous virus. So in this respect, I guess you could probably say we may be the lucky ones. But I just want to recognise that we know that actually businesses have been suffering quite badly. Um, and indeed, some have been doing quite well. So there's a real polarised view there. During the crisis, the Food and Drink Board uh, has been meeting regularly, sometimes daily, uh, more recently weekly. I mean, we're working with the Welsh Government uh, to provide solutions, hopefully, to the many problems that have encountered, and we're still meeting. For those of you who are interested, just a quick plug here. Um, we're looking to recruit new board members, um, and hopefully you will see the adverts that have gone up on the website. If not, please let us know, and we would welcome applications from members of the food and drink industry. We spent a lot of time engaging with Welsh food and drink businesses over the last few weeks. And what we've been doing is running a number of these webinars. And some of you may have been on the webinar um, that my colleague Hugh Thomas and the colleagues from the Welsh Government have run in terms of finance. Um, that was run this morning. It's a series of, of, of webinars. And that's really important because it actually gives people um, an opportunity to understand what it is they can do to get their businesses back up and running given the fact that finance is, is pretty critical. So we'll come on to that later. So the purpose of the webinar today is to present the coronavirus recovery strategy to you all, to key industry stakeholders. The outcome that we need to achieve is that we want all of you to understand and particularly engage in this strategy. We all know it's a completely new and challenging situation and there will be opportunities that are presented to us so the key point from what we're saying here is no plan is no plan is perfect but no plan is any worth while it's sat on the shelf what we need your help is to bring it alive and really turn this strategy into something that will benefit the Welsh food and drink sector the format of today's webinar is that we will um Dave Morris, I'll hand over to Dave Morris in a minute, who will give the Welsh Government a uh, perspective of the strategy and hopefully give you a view about how seriously the government intend to take this strategy forward working with industry. What we'll then do is actually go through each of the 11 action points and we'll do that by going through each of the board members. We'll go through one or even two. And so A, you'll meet these, the board members and secondly, we'll go through one by one so you understand what is it we're trying to do? What is the purpose? What is the outcome for each? And just hopefully bring each of the 11 action points to life. In terms of the objectives of what we're trying to achieve, we are trying to maximize the number of food and drink businesses that survive the, um, the coronavirus disruption. I think the slide will go, here we go. The objectives are up now. So our aim is to maximise the number of food and drink businesses that survive the imminent disruption caused by coronavirus. And we recognise it's not over yet. Um, that's really, really important that we do is get those businesses up and running again. Secondly, it's self-evident there are lots of jobs associated with food and drink in Wales. And it's really important that we actually keep those going. Thirdly, we want to get the sector recovering as fast as possible. Now, I, um, we all know that some businesses, particularly those that supply to retail, 
have done well. Some businesses who supply retail have not done well because the products have been deselected for a number of reasons. We also know that those businesses who supply hospitality have been devastated in the way they're affected. So it's critical that we get those businesses up and running in whatever way we can. The, 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 the fourth point there is focusing on what we call market aligned solutions. You know, we need to have an absolute ruthless, ruthless focusing on what the market needs. And we'll come on to that in, in, in a few minutes. But we know that the market is changing. I'm not going to preempt that because the more board members will be talking about that. But we have to make sure in Wales we are on top of the changing market for food and drink across the whole of the sector. And of course, if, if you believe the headlines, people are saying there may be another peak again in December. And of course, we know that coincides with uh, the B word, Brexit. So we know that we're heading for a very challenging time. So yeah, we're up for the challenge. We know it's going to be a big issue. Um, we need to make sure that we focus relentlessly on what the market needs. And finally, just to put this in context, you're aware that we had an action plan that took us from 2014 to 2020, and it had a number of objectives, one of which was growing from five to seven billion. We well, you know as a collective industry and the government, we, we've achieved that target. So what the board was working on was a strategy with Welsh government to take us forward for the next five, 10 years of our growth. The purpose of this strategy is really a 12 to 18 month strategy that will hopefully pull us through coronavirus. So it does not replace that new long-term strategy, but it's a stopgap, as I said before, to get us straight out of coronavirus. Okay, so that's that's a little bit of scene setting. What I'd like to do now is just pass over to David Morris from the Welsh Food and Drink, sorry, for the Welsh Government. Um, David's very kindly going to give us an overview um, about the Welsh Government's view to this, what his summary is, what his take is, and what his expectations are for the Welsh Government. So can I pass over to David Morris, please? Uh, thank you, Andy, and good afternoon, all. Um, as Andy has mentioned, the minister would like to extend her apologies. She really did want to be part of this webinar today, but um, last minute uh, challenges arose and, and she couldn't be here. But she has asked me to share a few of her thoughts uh, with you. Uh, firstly, to thank you all for joining the webinar, because um, it, it's great to have so many businesses actively engaged in the conversation. And it, it's a tool, if you like, that we're probably going to use more often and because it seems to be working so well. Um, she also uh, would like to sort of reiterate the point that um, despite the unexpected events and um, COVID-19 and indeed the challenges that Brexit and EU exit would present again at the end of this year, um, the, the, Welsh, the Minister and the Welsh Government and Food Division are there to support the sector because the food and drink sector is really important in Wales. The food chain as a whole employs about 230,000 people. That's an awful lot of people. And the um, minister knows that there's a number of jobs at risk there as well because of, of all the problems that COVID has thrown at uh, different parts of the chain. Um, <clears throat> Andy mentioned uh, the, the fact that we had the, the target of 7 billion turnover to achieve uh, under the the current food and drink action plan. And I'll just correct him really, because he said we achieved the target. We actually exceeded the target and we reached 7.4 billion at the end of 2019 compared to a 7 billion target in 2020. And, and you know, that's no mean achievement. And that's down to the, the businesses themselves, as well as the, the wraparound sort of broad spectrum support that has been provided. And if you take into account that we had the Brexit referendum in June 2016, uh, and that led to a degree of uncertainty for the sector um, since that period. And yet businesses have, with their optimism and determination and innovation, have carried on and exceeded the target we set. Um, our support has evolved hugely over that period, and we've introduced innovative programs of support, such as product, Project Helix, to, to stimulate and, and encourage more innovation in the sector and 
an awful lot has happened um, since 2014 and the plan was originally published. Uh, we have initiatives such as the Food Business Cluster Initiative and it's great because we have the majority of food businesses in Wales are now engaged in the clusters programme and that's a, a direct opportunity to, for um, government officials to work closely with businesses to understand what are the issues that matter to businesses and to help those businesses to come up with solutions and to take advantage of opportunities that they identify. And another interesting and novel programme is the Kuain programme, the programme that helps startups and, and small micro businesses uh, to grow and succeed and, and to help them to acquire the skills and support they need. So all of those programs will, will continue and um, Andy has mentioned that our, our current strategy is due to end this year 2020. We've already done a huge amount of work on the new strategy um, but be given the crisis of COVID-19, uh, the Welsh Government and the Board working really closely together have come up with the COVID-19 recovery plan which you're going to hear more about today. Um, it's important to say that when COVID started or COVID happened in Wales in, 20, in March of this year, uh, we didn't just draw a halt to the programmes of support that were already in place. Uh, and instead, actually, it, we, we, we really increased the momentum with some of those programmes. And those programmes carry on. But what we are doing is reconfiguring a number of those programmes, both to address the COVID-19 challenges and um, to make sure we can take full advantage of new and developing opportunities, uh, and also so that we can support businesses through the Brexit change. Because, you know, EU exit hasn't gone away and there are challenges there for food businesses. And um, there will also be opportunities and we want to make sure that we help you uh, to develop those opportunities as well. So I'll now hand you back to Andy and um, he'll take you through the, the actions in the COVID-19 recovery plan. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. I might have guessed you correct me on that. Quite rightly, we exceeded our um, target and uh, I would like to see any other um, food and drink businesses in the UK that are grown at the same rate. So I think the message there is we're clearly doing something right and that's obviously a combination of food businesses uh, and what government are doing so we want to keep that going um as i mentioned and dave mentioned what we're going to present to you now is a plan it's a strategic plan there's two things one is if we if we say we've done a good job and leave it today then we've done nothing yeah what we have to do now is actually ask for your help and other people's help in the industry to really bring this to life and make sure we do something as a result of it. So the purpose of today is no more than just out of courtesy, present the 11 points of the plan to you all. Um, I, I conscious and you know, we're very conscious on the call that it's not a two way dialogue. Um, but what we want to do is please, please, please send your questions in on the chat. I won't pick on people. I will just pick up themes and individual questions. And again, we want this to be beginning of a conversation. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to, I'm going to first pass over to Norma Barry, board member. Uh, Norma will introduce herself. Uh, she will cover the first point and then we will pass through the different members of the board seamlessly, hopefully passing on the baton. Um, till we finish with Justine um, Fosh at point 11, at which point we'll hopefully pill it, um, pick up some of the, um, the chat questions you've got later on. So Norma, can I hand over to you please to cover market sure. intelligence? Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Chair. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And it's really good that so many of you have, have um, tuned into this webinar. And um, as David said, it's a great, great way of communicating with the industry. Um, as stated by the Chair, the primary purpose of this webinar is to ensure that the recovery plan is fully understood and that you engage in its delivery. Um, I'm, I'm covering the first section, which is about monitoring market intelligence and ensuring Welsh Government support is based on this intelligence. And the importance of scanning the external environment continually by monitoring marketing intelligence, amongst other major economic, environmental, social and political issues, is fundamental to the survival of all businesses. This is why the board and the Welsh Government have prioritised this action and included it and are including it for the longer term. Whilst there will always be a need for food and drink, we have actually seen demand drop in recent months of about 27, by about 
Our experience has shown that external factors can have an immediate effect on the operation of any business and we need to be prepared. The tourism and hospitality businesses have been particularly hard to hit, which in turn has impacted on some of our Welsh food and drink businesses, in particular our food service companies. Although there has been an opening up of these sectors over recent weeks, it is likely that it will be some years, if ever, before we see a return to previous levels of business. The board, in partnership with Welsh Government, is supporting the sector to become more responsive to economic and other changes at the macro and micro levels. Apart from COVID-19, we are faced with significant strategic challenges in respect of Brexit, climate change and changing consumer habits and behaviours. A lot of these are arising as a result of the, the, the pandemic and its economic consequences. These have implications for your businesses in terms of supplies, manufacturing products in response to changing consumer demands, organising your operational arrangements, logistics and distribution channels, your cash flows and access to capital, and the health and welfare of your staff, which is becoming increasingly important, more important rather. Recent market intelligence indicates that product ranges are now being rationalised. More consumers of all ages, including the elderly, are buying online and people are likely to be looking to buy value ranges and subject to disposable income, the occasional treats for eating in. There appears to be less reliance on ready meals and more home, co and more home cooking, with concerns about healthy eating and an inclination to eat outside the home on fewer occasions, as well as the preference for buying local. At a micro, i.e. company level, what does this mean for our producers and what actions do you need to take to survive and prosper in the current and future challenging times? In the light of um, current market intelligence, you might want to consider the following. Don't overlook the importance of scanning the external environment and trends and being prepared for the unexpected. I think that's one lesson we can learn from this pandemic. Reconfiguring your operations to look after the health of the workforce, training of staff on the new normal, taking advantage of technological developments to improve productivity, ensure product ranges meet consumer trends and market demands, and review your logistics and sales channels. Finally, just to remind you that there are other strategic issues impacting on the sector apart from COVID and Brexit. And these are going to impact on your business going forward. And these factors include an ageing population, slow economic growth, which is going to be inevitable, continual environmental pressures, political polarisation, health and well-being being high on government's agendas, and digi digital, digital and technological advances. Welsh Government will be doing what it can to support you in addressing these issues through its monitoring activities and its various support mechanisms will be based on this market intelligence. As business owners, it is fundamentally down to you to engage through the, the clusters and various networks in order to understand this market intelligence and to act in order to, develop, to continue to develop your, your companies. Thank you very much. And I'm now going to hand over to Hugh, Hugh Thomas. Thank you, Norma. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm Hugh Thomas, the uh, Managing Director of uh, Having Produce and uh, another board member. Um, I'm dealing with number two on the list of actions, which is a, a bit of a catch all really. It's um, the practical business advice. What, it, what I think uh, we're, we're saying here is that there's some great programs already been delivered by the Welsh Government and what we're trying to do is, you know, is keep the energy within those programs and further enhance them in light of COVID. I think David mentioned that earlier. So if you talk about the advice that's already available on leadership, marketing, business planning, innovation, product reformulation through the programs that are already offered by the Welsh Government, it's uh, it's keeping our energy in those in those areas and, uh, you know, yeah, adding more resource to, the, to those areas. I think if you go, if you're not aware of the programs that are available, you know, I would recommend to everybody to, you know, look at the the website, the the 
the Food and Drink Wales website, uh, the Food Innovation website, um, to you know to see the programs that are available. But I suppose you know some of the most notable ones are things like Food Innovation Wales. Um, Project Helix. You know, I think we've got David uh, speaking later on who will perhaps give him more detail on that. There's a cluster that has been a fantastic success the last couple of years. You know, so that's a that's a great conduit for everybody to communicate. You know, with the fantastic range of consultants that are available to support businesses in Wales, Coine. You know, helping micro businesses, these type of things, and things like the Trade Development Program, Meet the Buyer. You know, you know these type of programs that are already there. So. You know, all I would say is this is, you know, adding energy to the programs that are already there and, uh, you know, perhaps tailoring them for COVID as well. So if there's a, if you're unaware of the of the programs that are already offered by the Welsh Government, I would recommend that everybody familiarises themselves with those. So um, so I think that's uh, that bit from me, Andy. I'll pass back to Andy. OK, thank you very much, Hugh. Um, Sorry, everybody, you got me again for the next two points. So the first one is actually online. So what we're looking to do here is to pick up on the fact that I think you probably all know already that certainly during the crisis, online sales have taken off stratospherically. Um, and it's really important that we actually understand what those trends are and that Welsh food and drink and the supply chain is completely connected to that. Um, there are no doubt there are opportunities. And I know it's actually very difficult saying that there are opportunities at the moment when most of us are in crisis mode. But I think it's really important that we try to understand what of the trends that are going on at the moment, which of those are going to stick, online being one. What does it look like in six, 12, two, three, or even four months' time? Uh, sorry, three or four years time, see what those trends are going to be sticking and actually address our, address our offering accordingly in Wales. And I think there's two parts to it. One is actually um, developing online is not just about helping people to develop really good websites, although that is part of it. And part of it is understanding you know, what is engaging about the Welsh food and drink brand. But more importantly, it's about how we access those online. You know, are there ways we can do it smartly? Um, can we do it collectively in a collaborative way? Do we need to work together with distributors to get Welsh projects produce to the markets, you know, delivered to homes? You know, there are a number of things that need to be done in terms of accessing this online behaviour. And it also ties in very neatly with what Norman was saying. And I think indeed you mentioned the online because we have to really understand how it forms part of the of the trends of what the consumer is doing going forward. So it's really just to make a flag that the third point of our strategy is about capturing the opportunity that we believe online presents. OK, so that's the third point. The fourth point, which I'm going to cover as well, is about productivity, resilience and risk management. What we're trying to do is to say, look, we need to target um, investment in people, technology and premises as well to make sure that we are actually focusing on produce added value products that, of course, the market wants. But the way we want to do that is, as I said, productivity is absolutely essential. We need to look uh, such tools such as lean principles. I'm sure most of you, many of you actually use those already. And we have to really enable that. And I know as an aside, I've been showing some work in the dairy sector, the UK dairy sector, looking at productivity. And I know that it's a very sensitive subject because as an aside, you know, our evidence we have is that 80% of producers think they're in the top 25%. And therefore it is quite a sensitive thing for a lot of people. Um, and we, we also have to recognize that what is holding back businesses varies between different businesses. So it's not one or two solutions that fit all. So productivity is not a cliche. It is definitely something that we need to work on collectively. And it's not something that the board or even the Welsh Government are going to solve on our own. Um, I'm also involved in the UK Food and Drink Sector Council, and there was a work stream there looking at productivity. So it's very important um, that we are part of that uh, and understand what our opportunities are in Wales. So that's productivity. The second point on the fourth point um, is about resilience. 
No, I don't think anybody saw coronavirus coming. And I don't know anybody who had coronavirus on their risk register. Um, and it is very difficult because a lot of businesses have done extremely well out of taking advantage of, of key markets. And we all know that those that focus brilliantly on, on hospitality have unfortunately been, been hit very badly. And that's certainly no criticism of, of their business at all. Uh, and I don't think anybody foresaw that you were going to find a situation where hospitality would be shut down overnight. But what we have to do is to try to understand is what equals a resilient business model. Can we help businesses develop their strategies? It's a question rather than a proposal. Can we help businesses develop their strategies to ensure they are more resilient business models? And partly, can we actually help with their risk mitigation, with their risk management, really understand what the points of risks are? Um, it's not about underwriting them. It's about can we find innovative, different ways, solutions to help them do that. So the fourth point there was really about um, developing a more productive, uh, resilient and less risky business models and you know we, we hope that we can look at things such as automation technical excellence lean principles certainly the benefits of working in collaboration and many of you will be involved in the cluster concept um, and actually fundamentally looking at efficiencies gained through sustainable practices so you know, sustainability is a big part of that so the, the fourth point of the plan is quite a big one and it's going to need a lot of unpacking, but it's so fundamental to our success. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is pass the virtual baton on now to Alison, um, another board member who will be talking about added value. Thank Thanks, you Alison. Very, thank you, Andy. Okay, my, my bit is about supporting businesses and supply chains to add value based on research, market opportunities, and through working with research, innovation, and product development partners. So Wales is known um, throughout the world for its primary products. And in my opinion, we need to make more of those and uh, get them, get them uh, better known, even better known. So everything I'm going to mention needs industry buy-in and enthusiasm to work. And it has to be a partnership between the Welsh Government producers and the delivery partners. And all the actions um, and all the people who will deliver them are designed to help businesses be more sustainable and spread the risk between different markets. Because a lot of us found in COVID, uh, the beginning of COVID and at its peak, that we had literally all our eggs in one basket and we need to try to guard against that in the future. So as a producer, I know how lucky we are to have the resources to draw on. And I know how much we've um, we've appreciated the support in the last few months. So a lot of work is done through the clusters and those businesses that work together are open to helping each other. And the other, the other really important point is that they can influence what's on offer. So if they want something different to what's on offer, they can ask for it. Research reports are available from the likes of Kantar, IGD, IGD and Brookdale Consulting, and they're available freely on the Welsh Government Food and Drink website and also through the cluster leads. So I would encourage you to have a look at those. We also have the three food technology centres who will support businesses to achieve SALSA and BRC accreditations, which are essential now for working with larger retailers and manufacturers. And I think, as Andy has already spoken, Coine is working with micro businesses on a one to one basis. And I'm happy to say there's a flow of new business inquiries coming forward, even in these troubled times. The clusters also hold free to enter virtual and physical events. So this year we had a virtual tuck in, which was a marketing conference. Um, organised by the Fine Food Cluster under the umbrella of the Food and Drink Industry Board. And that was uh, showcasing uh, best practice in marketing and product development. And it also acts as a B2B platform. The clusters also run on online courses in food and drink 
trade, oh, sorry, as part of the food and drink trade program on selling skills, e-commerce, setting up Amazon accounts, LinkedIn for business, data management, etc. And there was a whole slew of webinars around maximizing social media and looking at mental health and HR issues, to name but a few. Another initiative from the Trade Development Programme is Carry Cymru, Carry Blas, the virtual marketing campaign which all producers are welcome to join. There's a downloadable toolkit to use on, on the celebration days with set dates to target. It's on the Business Wales website. The, the next one is this Friday and it's heralded by a film with Rod Gilbert. And the next one is in September the 3rd. Visit Wales is also work, uh, working closely with the food division to promote it. It's mainly business to consumer and it encourages consumers to support the hospitality industry, Welsh producers and retailers by buying Welsh food and drink. And then finally, as part of this, I wanted just to talk briefly about the Sustainable Brand Values Programme. Domestic and overseas consumers want high quality standards in terms of food production, animal welfare and sustaining our natural environment. And different markets want different attributes. So I read a piece in by Brookdale Consulting telling me, for example, that the UK is concerned about single use plastics, while South Americans are worried about the use of water, not something that we suffer from a lack of in Wales. And Asians are more focused on health, with mentions of salt, sugar, fat and calories in, in the food that they consume. So this programme will drive continuous improvement by being inclusive and sharing and evidencing good practice against robust quality standards framework. And it's being taken forward by a special interest cluster group with members drawn from across the clusters, plus academic partners to add value. Is, is a bit of a tricky one because healthy products are quite hard to achieve if you're making something like pies or indeed harvesting sea salt. But manufacturers can work towards using clean ingredients and so would be healthy from this perspective. And this cluster will also tie into special interest groups such as sustainable red meat and dairy and carry out supply chain work to substitute Welsh ingredients for imported ones um, which is obviously very useful as we uh, finally sever our ties with Europe and better understand the areas of sustainable work that will make a real difference to the bottom line in everyday business. So I'm handing back now to Hugh, thank you, to talk about affordable finance. Thank you, Alison. <clears throat> um, I think uh, if we go back a couple of years until when the, the board was formed, one of the areas I think we all agreed with um, was that there was a gap in support for young and smaller businesses to improve their financial skills. So we've managed to develop a, a programme over the last couple of years that helped us help bridge that gap. So you know the action that we've got written here you know, as number six is is yeah is based on the understanding that we our businesses need to have strong financial skills. Obviously, all of that has come under much more pressure um, since the COVID, the COVID issue, you know, and there's a lot of businesses having to take on more debt and, you know, are struggling to keep going as we're all aware. So it's, it's ensuring those businesses that are not experts perhaps in that area, have got the support they need to be able to, to, to finance, the, keeping their businesses going as cheaply as they can. Um, so there's a program that started a number of years ago, but that, but that program has now had to adapt to, to help businesses through this crisis. And that is uh, the Investor Ready and Financial Resilience Program that is uh, run by BIC Innovation. You know, the way you, a lot of you will know Linda Grant, who's a project lead of that. Um, and that's a fantastic resource. They've got some great consultants working for them that, that will help businesses if they've got problems, you know, they, they concentrate on areas like improving accounting and information systems, um, facilitating funding, financial modeling, you know, and helping you consider different sources of capital. So, it, you know, there's a great resource there that, that the company should tap into if they need it, you know. One of the things we've been doing is, you know, is trying to 
kind of get the message out there about the program and to help upskill smaller businesses. We've run a series of seminars that Andy mentioned right at the beginning, and the third one of which was this morning, and we've covered uh, areas uh, focusing on trade credit. Um, we've done on, one on mitigating risk and forecasting, and the third one this morning was on the maintaining kind of cash and liquidity, and you know, we've got a good attendance to those, and I think people have found them useful. We've got some very good speakers, and uh, you know, it's helping people to think about how they manage that part of their business. So uh, there's a great um, strand of support there, you know, and again, I would recommend everybody to uh, to tap into that, to, you know, if they feel like it will help their business. Um, so I'm going to pass over to David Lloyd now, who is going to talk about accreditation. Thank you, Hugh. Um... Yep, it, I was just going to spend a few minutes talking about uh, the importance of accreditation and the various types of accreditation that you can get. At the beginning of the, uh, this COVID crisis, um, we did a little bit of work which showed that about 28% of food companies, and I mean by that food processors, uh, were furloughed because uh, the, the focus of the marketplace was um, hospitality. And I'm aware that um, there are many people on uh, online here today who are in the hospitality sector. Um, and the one thing that will undoubtedly come out of this is that we need to um, diversify uh, or at least spread the risk by going into different markets. One of the critical elements um, to open up those markets is accreditation. Um, started about 20 years ago in the retailers, uh, part of the due diligence defence was to look at um, accrediting companies. And there are two key third party accreditations which exist in, in the UK and Wales, and they're SALSA and they're BRC. There's, by our reckoning, somewhere between 900 and 1,000 registered food processes, processes in Wales. Um, but when I give you the figures, maybe 89 of those are registered against SALSA and about 120 in one of the forms are the BRC um, accreditation. So we've got a long way to go in terms of getting numbers up. And by getting that accreditation, we significantly open up the marketplace to a lot of Welsh food companies. And, and, and undoubtedly, one way out of this is to, uh, is to gain these accreditations. Um, the, the salsa is for local supply, and I think you can supply Wales generally on that, but you'll also be able to supply some of the you know, non-larger retailers if you have salsa in the UK. Um, that's generally about half a day. Um, it's, uh, it, it, it's relatively low cost. I say relatively low cost. It's around £600. But the opportunity that it opens up in new markets is, um, is significant. There is, and, and that's the first step in stone, um, uh, on the stages to um, accreditation and opening up markets. And don't be scared of it because the support mechanism in Wales is, um, is second to none. Um, there's a new BRC audit called BRC Start, which is uh, about a one-day audit. It's more expensive. I think it's probably in the region of about £1,000, but don't quote me. And it depends on which certification body you use. But it's a midway point between SALSA and BRC uh, GS, which is the global standard, which is recognised globally. Um, the BRC GS is a much larger standard, a much larger uh, audit. It's um, anything sort of two, two and a half days um, and beyond, depending on your product and the, the, the size of your site. Um, and that's in the region of anything between 1,500 and two and a half thousand pounds in the costs of the, um, uh, of the auditor. But it is global. So it opens up export markets um, and is uh, really the pinnacle of accreditations. Let me just say at this point that um, the Helix program has been pointed out, um, which is particularly ap applicable to uh, startups, micro and SMEs. Um, it's uh, subsidized, so it's um, good value. Um, and it's administered Pan Wales by the three food centres based in uh, Food Centre Wales in Ceredigion, in Food Technology Centre in Llangevny and Anglesey, and the Food Industry Centre at Cardiff Metropolitan University. I would urge you, like you did, to visit the Food Innovation Wales website um, and just get in contact because the technologists that are based around Wales are all SALSA approved auditors and all have gone through um, uh, the third party audit training with the BRC. So it is, in my opinion, a fairly unique offering in Wales. Um, I'd urge small companies that have not yet thought about it to think about it and get involved. 
And if there are um, hospitality companies out there who are looking to diversify because they have products within their menus which they think will sell, please contact us. Um, now I'm going to hand over for the next section back to Alison Lee Wilson, who's going to talk about the retail plan. Right, I'll try and keep this very brief. Um, thank you, David. Um, so the retail plan was um, was written and was ready to roll. And guess when it was completed? February 2020. So it's actually been now completely rewritten to encompass the growth areas, um, such as the ones that Andy was referring to, um, online trading and also the rise of convenience stores. Um, so the food and drink trade programme maintains an excellent relationship with all the major retails and it does help facilitate events uh, where, where producers can pitch to them, such as the Morrison's virtual food makers. But just to echo David again, Salsa and BRC are absolutely crucial to participating in that kind of occasion. So I'm going to move on um, to the, the next point, which is maintaining our global trade presence and Wales brand through virtual engagement with overseas trade buyers. Um, Howard Mon has been very uh, lucky. We have participated in a lot of virtual trade missions. I have to pay tribute to one of the contractors now who's worked with the Food and Drink Industry Board. Um, they could have just sat on their hands when COVID happened, but they didn't. They looked at uh, new ways of delivering programmes and instead of physical trade missions, they made them virtual. And I have personally been virtually to Singapore and Australia and also on offer are the Nordics, uh, Netherlands and Belgium, Qatar and Japan. And they can all be accessed through membership of the Export Club and everybody is welcome to that. And I'm sure Mark will put the link up to that. It's a great cost effective way of getting market information and targeted meetings with buyers who really want to buy. And the beauty of it is that you send samples out in advance, you have your meeting with the buyer by Zoom and you talk them through the samples and you can both taste them together. There are also other virtual events taking place like three e-wine men again with samples being delivered, but this time to consumers in advance. And there is another um, trade show in October called In Innovate, if that's how you pronounce it, which is a completely new way of accessing buyers as all uh, meetings will take place online. But we, don't, we really don't know how that one's going to pan out, but it's a, a learning experience and it's probably worth doing because it's heavily subsidised. And if nothing else, we'll learn how to do things in the future. And just two more little things. I, I wanted just to note here that the Y Valley Producer Group marketing initiative, where, where a band of producers got together um, to sell direct to consumers, and the Neges box scheme on Anglesey, which uh, was putting um, food together for vulnerable and shielded people, have both been picked up by a Canadian academic as case studies of how to innovate best in a pandemic. And looking ahead um, to a, possibly a physical um, uh, show, the food division and fine food clusters taking a stand at the farm shop in Delhi and the food and drink expo in April 2021 in the NEC. And the stand will overlap both halls and create the Welsh village. So thank you very much for listening and handing over now to Katie Palmer to talk about public procurement. Thank you, Alison. Um, hello, everybody. Yeah, I'm Katie Palmer. I'm program manager at Food Sense Wales, um, and um, we're nearly at the end. Point ten. We've got one more to go after this. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about um, focusing really on investment on businesses that have strong economical and sustainable business models um, and really have a look at how the food and drink sector contributes to the wider conversation that Welsh Government are having at the moment regarding our future Wales um, and the um, post-Covid reconstruction consultation, which is a bit of a mouthful. So the purpose of this point really is to ensure that investment in the food and drink sector drives resilience by contributing to Welsh Government's commitment to social, economic and environmental justice as laid out by the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. 
This point recognises that the food and drink sector is part of the foundational economy, so food is an essential good for everyday life. And as such, Welsh Government wants to invest in those businesses that seek to promote social justice, so that's thinking about things like jobs, livelihoods, access to nutritious food, um, environmental protection, uh, thinking about climate um, and protecting nature, and public health, so supporting safe and healthy diets for everyone. And doing this while contributing to growing the green economy. And I just want to point out that each of these factors apply at home in Wales, but are also really important in ensuring our global responsibility. And I, I've noted um, a question in the chat box um, around deforestation that perhaps we can pick up later. So Welsh Government already has a framework for achieving this investment goal through um, the economic contract. And the economic contract is part of Welsh Government's, government's Prosperity for All, um, the Economic Action Plan. And this has been designed to enable Welsh Government to develop strong business relationships uh, to drive inclusive growth and responsible business behaviours. So companies seeking support enter into an ongoing dialogue with Welsh Government and it's about committing to this sort of something for something approach. So the economic contract requires businesses seeking investment to demonstrate um, their growth potential. Uh, that they're going to provide fair work as defined by the Fair Work Commission. They're going to promote health um, and they're going to make progress in reducing the carbon footprint. And I have to say these, these principles were put forward um, pre-COVID. So just to finish off by giving you some examples of the sorts of um, businesses that the Welsh Government might be looking to invest in as part of a green recovery. So looking at businesses that are supporting fair wages and good working conditions, including training opportunities, businesses that are investing in low carbon technology, innovation in products and services that contribute to a healthy diet and low environmental impact, innovation in supporting low income communities to access affordable nutritious food, businesses that can support local food infrastructure, and this is where uh, public procurement could come into the frame, demonstration of waste reduction, high animal welfare standards, and there are many more. And um, as Alison explained earlier, uh, one of the mechanisms in achieving this would be buy-in through the Sustainable Brand um, Values Programme. So the ultimate aim is to ensure that investment in the food and drink sector is channeled into business support, which ensures the health of the nation, safeguards the environment and promotes social justice while driving the green economy. I am now going to pass over to the final point to Justine. Thanks very much, Katie. OK, so skills has formed a really important aspect of the board's work um, and it will remain so going forward. Uh, this is described in the 11th and final objective as a good place to work, train and develop skills. So why is that important? Well, because ultimately it's our people who make this industry great, from the innovators creating new products to the engineers keeping factories running, um, and particularly not forgetting those owners and managers whose skills and resilience have seen them navigating their businesses through the evolving challenges of COVID-19 keeping their people safe whilst continuing to produce food to feed the nation. And I think if the pandemic has brought home two, two things, I think that firstly they are that we have to look out for each other, not just in our households and communities, but in our workplaces too, looking out for one another's physical and mental health. And secondly, that we've seen, and we've seen some really good examples of that. Secondly, I think it has shown just how vital the food and drink industry is to the whole nation sustaining and feeding the population throughout the pandemic. We could not have responded as we have without the skilled, adaptable and committed people we have. Food and drink hasn't always been seen as a good place to work. In fact, it's often overlooked as a career destination of choice, which makes it hard to attract people into our industry. And yet we know that in Wales, the food industry offers great jobs, many supporting local communities, and that those who come into our industry are often surprised to find out just how rewarding careers in our sector can be. So a good place to work, train and develop skills is about how we ensure that we look after our people, we build the industry reputation as providing great employment and how we ensure that we develop a culture of investing in skills for the long term. There is in Wales significant help available to, to both individuals and all types of businesses through the Business Wales Skills Gateway 
But beyond that, you've heard a lot about the huge range of support that's available, um, which is food and drink specific, such as the tuck-in, which Alison mentioned earlier on. Also unique to Wales are the apprenticeship systems. And in Wales, we have great apprentices with the opportunity to develop existing and recruit and train new staff for roles in butchery, bakery, brewing, food engineering, and food operations, just to name a few. There are some major reforms being taking place to apprenticeships currently, and apprenticeships are designed by the industry for the industry. So for those who are interested in getting involved and understanding more and finding out more about the consultation, uh, please do visit the website for the National Skills Academy for Food and Drink, which Mark's going to put up in a sec, and do go in and respond to the consultation to make sure that your voice is heard. In addition to this, I'm picking up on one of the uh, questions, I think, in the in the chat around about the availability of labour and how can we encourage more people into the industry. There's work being done to develop a food and drink specific employment support programme that will provide relevant industry training to help those who are either unemployed or might be, be made unemployed due to the pandemic. And they can gain new and very specific skills in the food sector to enable them to retrain and enter the industry. Our aim is to ensure that as we move forward, businesses in Wales have access to the skills they need to drive recovery, productivity and growth. We have a great story to tell, provide great jobs and have access to some amazingly strong packages of support. I'm a passionate believer in the importance and value of skills uh, and developing people and I'm really excited to be supporting this agenda as part of working with colleagues on the board. That concludes our uh, overview of the 11 priorities and I'm now going to hand back over to Andy to summarise. Lovely, thanks Justine. Well now you've all met the board and more importantly you've actually been introduced to our houses so um, I hope you've uh, found that helpful. Thank you very much for um, the board members in going through the sections. Thank you to our guests for, for bearing with us. It's really not easy to get these points across virtually but what we wanted to do was to actually try to take the time to explain what we're trying to do. This is the beginning of a conversation. We don't pretend it's all going to be finished now. What I'd like to do is in the last 10 minutes, and we will finish dot on half past five, is just to pick up a few themes from what people have been saying. I apologise that we don't get to all of your questions. We will answer those that we haven't answered during the call later on. I'd just like to pick up what uh, Nick and Simon have been saying about hospitality. Um, you know, we're all aware that hospitality has been affected, you know, devastated by the, the coronavirus challenge. So what I'd just like to do is ask perhaps Dave Morris whether you'd like to comment uh, on um, Simon and Nick's questions very quickly, please. We can uh, answer yeah, very short. Thank, thank you, Andy. Uh, and yes, to reiterate your point, uh, we are all, and that includes all of our ministers from the first minister down, are acutely aware of the difficulties the hospitality sector has faced in COVID. <clears throat> when we look at the whole of the food chain, um, it is been hit but much harder than any other part of that chain and uh, and we know the fact that the sector had to close down it was not easy we know that the way of reopening and luckily it is now reopened but it, at the same time it's not easy because of the social distancing requirements and and the other restrictions that are placed on you in terms of numbers so it, it, it's a slow return and we also know that um, there are going to be some hospitality businesses that probably won't reopen and indeed there will be some food manufacturing businesses that won't reopen. But we have to, um, in terms of sustaining your customer base, um, some of the current initiatives are helpful. So the August discount on eating out, I, I think that's been a, a real success already, although we're only less than a week into um, indoor reopening in Wales. Um, I, I know I ate out myself last night in Cardiff. I had to book a restaurant in advance. There was no chance you could just turn up and expect that there would be capacity. Now, I know because of social distancing, there are fewer people in the restaurants, but 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 that is good. And, and what's really good about that is it's giving people confidence to eat out again. And once they've done it once or twice and they have the confidence, they will return. We also, we know that staycations is, is a feature, is the main feature of the, if we like to call it that, the holiday season this year. So people generally are not going abroad for obvious reasons, and that means they're holidaying at home. Uh, and I know myself, I live in a rural area, and, and all of the, the holiday cottages are fully booked, all of the Airbnb, all of the campsites, and all of those people need to eat when they're on holiday. Um, they won't all eat in restaurants, but given incentives and encouragement and, and proper promotion, of Welsh food, which is something we're doing, 
they will they they will certainly sample some of the local produce in local hotels and restaurants. So there's there's some room for optimism, and that's encouraging. And um, the marketing and promotion is really important. We talked about carry Cymru, carry blast. We also um, HCC had a, a campaign to promote Welsh beef back in the middle of the crisis, and the sales increased hugely on the back of that. So getting promotion and marketing at every level correct is important. Um, and we also our, our Welsh government food tourism action plan is due for revision uh, this year uh, and you know we need to consider the challenges to to hospitality uh, due to covid-19 uh, and how we can we can affect that m- much better in the future um i should also add of course that the hospitality sector itself is the responsibility the lead minister is minister skates uh, and deputy minister and david ellis thomas um having said that it, it the join up is very very important and and all of the cabinet is alive to the problems in the sector. Okay, thanks David. And can I just say to Nick and Simon or anybody else raising questions about hospitality, I really want to engage with you after this meeting. So could you somehow get your contact details to me and maybe we can arrange a conversation. Um, We're very aware of hospitality issues, but we need to make sure we really, really understand them. So thank you. Um, There was a question here about market intelligence uh, from Kevin Harrington, uh, which I'd like to ask in a minute. Um, David Lloyd for his perspective on that. But before I come to David, um, I just wanted to pick up on what Paul Flanagan had raised. And Paul, I'm trying to find the question now, skirting down the page. Paul was saying, how can we work uh, with other parts of the UK who are promoting food and drink on pre-competitive errors and learnings? Well, great question, Paul. And certainly there's not enough collaboration that goes on at the moment. Partly an answer is that we've been very aware of that um, through initiatives such as the Food and Drink Federation Roundtable, uh, the devolved food and drink boards, uh, brackets England, Scotland, Wales, because there isn't an England one, um, have been having discussions about how we can work together. Um, And there are sort of official and unofficial uh, roundtables for the devolved, so we, we learn from each other. Uh, We've also had a lot of success recently where we've got uh, government departments together, most recently DIT, DEFRA and um, the Devolved Food and Drink Boards to discuss the export uh, initiative and the the borders issue. So um, it's a challenging area, Paul, um, but I think collaboration is definitely getting better and it's certainly good between the devolved. Thank you for that. Okay, um, can we just go to David Lloyd for your perspective, please, on the Karen Harrington question on market intelligence? You may be on. I'm, I'm trying to trying to find it. Is it towards the base? Uh, yeah. So it's at the uh, so the, the question that um, Kevin had was about how can we share the market intelligence? I think I'll try and find it myself. Here we go. What is the Welsh Government and, and the Food and Drink Board, I think it's more related to, is to make sure that market intelligence is available to business. So I think the question is about how do we provide information? Uh, um, it's not my area, but I'll give it a go. Um, I, um, there, there are a variety of um, avenues already in place for that. Um, uh, there are market intelligence for export. So there are short, sharp um, export um, support mechanisms where you can look at a, well, you can take your product range and look at um, potential export areas to see whether that would fit in a, in a particular area of the world. But there's also significant quantities of data. I think it was perhaps Alison who touched on it earlier on, or maybe Norma, um, things like Kantar data, which Welsh government purchase and which is available to food companies. Um, there is a support mechanism, and I, I come from industry, and I wish I'd had this when I was in industry. There's a support mechanism um, ranging from technical to market intelligence um, and skills, but within the market intelligence, there are two or three bodies who will work with companies to um, look at market trends, but also to look at their product ranges and best fit. So I'm thinking of the likes of uh, Mentor of Business in particular, um, Brookdale. Um, they're really, I think the, the, the best bet is to get in contact with someone from the food division within, within Andrew Martin's team who will guide you to um, the re- re- relevant support body. Um, okay. And if you are a food producer, um, I would urge, as Alison's urged, to join the cluster groups. 
because there's um, another route into the food division and the and the um, market intelligence there, but also, as Alison said, learning from other food companies who are at um, a more advanced stage of development, perhaps, than, than okay. other people. Thanks, Dave. I'm conscious that there are other from the board who wanted to comment, but I do want to move on because we've got literally two minutes left. So apologies for that. I just want to pick up a question from Julia Hunt on about nature and, and the environment. Um, to paraphrase the question, I think what Julie was saying is there enough in, in, in the strategy about nature and natural capital. Uh, well, we've tried to make sure it's there. Certainly from our point of view, point four was about sustainable practices and the point that Katie was talking there about sustainable business models. So if we haven't made that strong enough, then apologies, um, Julia. But I think we all on the board and Welsh Government really passionate about natural capital and recognise it's a big part of it. So again, if you want to take that conversation offline, more than happy to. OK, so I'm conscious we said we would finish at half past five and we, we will. It's half past five. Um, what we well, we weren't going to ever be able to answer all your questions today, but what we will do is firstly, we will make this a recording available. I think somebody was asking that question. So we will make the, the whole recording available so you can reflect on it. We will get back to you on your individual questions. If anybody wants to get in touch with us about what you've heard, please, please do. We really want to make the point is that we do not pretend that this strategy, this bit of paper is going to solve everything just by producing a bit of paper. Yeah, what we need to do is bring it life and we need your help to do that. So that's the conversations that we want to have with you uh, from a board point of view and a Welsh government point of view. So all I will do now is literally thank you very much to our guests for joining us, to everybody. Thank you for the board. Thank you for the Welsh government for organising it. And um, we look forward to our next webinar. So thank you very much for your time, everybody. Bye-bye.